everyone. Um, good afternoon. Um, I hope you are all doing great. Uh, I'm really happy to be the SLC moderator for today's uh, Friedman Family Lecture hosted by ERI chapter at UCLA. Um, my name is Ahmad Hassan. I'm a PhD candidate in the Structures Group at UC Davis. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, um, Jim Malley. Um, Jim is a senior principal with Dagan Kolb Engineers in San Francisco. He, he received both his bachelor's and master's degree from uh, UC Berkeley. He is a registered uh, structural engineer in California with over 30 years of experience in seismic design, evaluation, and rehabilitation of building structures. Um, he has been recently elected for the National Academy of Engineers, um, which is among the highest uh, professional distinctions accorded to an engineer. Um, Jim has conducted many peer reviews of performance-based design projects, and he plans to present how these projects are evaluated during his lecture today on performance-based earthquake engineering of tall buildings. Um, we will have the question and answers uh, session right after the lecture. Um, if you want, if you would like to stick around, and like as Jim mentioned, if you have any question, you could type it in the chat, and maybe we can discuss it. Um, after during the session of Q and A, um, without any further ado, I will hand it to Jim. Thank you, Ahmad, and uh, thanks to UCLA's ERI group for asking me to come again. Uh, I was, I think, uh, two or three years ago. I spoke on a different topic um, down there in person. I'm sorry we can't uh, be together in person today, but uh, we'll do the best we can virtually. So uh, before starting the, the formal lecture, I'm going to give a short presentation uh, that is uh, part of all these Friedman family um, visiting lecture program um, talks about EERI and encouraging people to uh, consider joining EERI uh, after you finish graduate school, or hopefully you have as a student member uh, already, but after you finish graduate school as a professional member. So EERI, as you can see, was uh, established in 1948, and it really is very unique in the, in the profession uh, because it does hit all of sort of the, the <clears throat> uh, professionals that have some interest in earthquake uh, engineering issues and, and earthquake resiliency and all those topics. So certainly there are many structural engineers um, and geotechnical engineers as well as you can see architects, planners, emergency management people, et cetera. So it, it does bring together that whole community, which is a very unique thing because for the most part, other professional organizations are pretty much siloed by discipline, but EERI is very cross, very much cross-disciplinary. So you can see the mission statement here, uh, trying to reduce earthquake risks by advancing the science and practice of earthquake engineering. So the technical side of things uh, improving the understanding the impact on the of earthquakes on the physical environment, and then advocating for um, trying to improve you know what we do in the community to make sure that we can uh, withstand the harmful effects of earthquakes in the future. And this would go toward things like trying to do uh, put forward legislation with the state of California, um, and ERI is very active in that to try and. Uh, move forward those sorts of things to help uh, improve our community resilience. So EERI again uh, connects you to many people um, and uh, helps to uh, uh, put together, you know, increase your, your network of, uh, of people within the profession. Um, there's a lot of technical um, information that's gathered and, and shared by EERI through their journals and webinars and uh, post-earthquake ins inspections and, and uh, investigations and reports. Um, so there's a, a, lot, a, a whole lot of things that you can get from a technical basis from being an ERI member. <clears throat> and then uh, um, an interaction with leaders in the profession. Right? And, and if you wanted to continue to, to move forward in that direction yourself, this is a great pl platform to do that. So my own story about ERI, um, when I started, there, there weren't uh, student chapters in those days, um, but it was uh, at Degenkolb, it was very much encouraged for us to join ERI. Henry Degenkolb was one of the founding members of the organization. 
And uh, in 1992, I was asked to join one of the post-earthquake inspection teams in a, an earthquake in central Turkey in Erzincan. Um, very interesting location on a fault to the North Anatolian Fault. It's very similar to the San Andreas Fault. And the earthquake uh, epicenter was basically under the city center for this, um, this small, small city. And so very devastating results to the city. Um, really an amazing learning experience for me and really kind of, um, kind of solidified my involvement with these ERI going forward. I've been a chair of a technical committee. I was involved with uh, organizing um, the, uh, the last National Committee on Earthquake Engineering, which was in June of 2018 in, in downtown LA and uh, was on the board and also vice president. So I've been pretty active with ERI over the years. So who are the members sort of touched on this before, very broad um, group of different professionals and uh, practicing professionals, academics, um, uh, public policy folks, et cetera. So lots of different ways to uh, participate in ERI. And the great thing is everybody has a different perspective on this and you can really learn a lot from uh, listening to other people's approaches and ideas. Some of the important programs, um, there's a school safety initiative program, which is very active in developing programs for teachers um, and outreach to um, you know, PTA groups, et cetera, to help them better prepare their local schools and, and educate um, all those folks um, so they know more about earthquakes and how, uh, how the schools can be improved. Learning from Earthquakes has always been a flagship uh, program for the organization. Um, it's been for many, many decades now, have been sending teams to earthquakes to gather information, bring that back and report on it to the, the, the Institute's membership. And as I mentioned, the, the one that I went to in, in, in Turkey um, and basically every major earthquake around the world uh, now has a, some type of, of reconnaissance uh, if, if just with local members of EERI that participate. And now we, there's a lot of virtual work that's going on there um, and sharing uh, data through pictures and, and information like that and, and using the technology that's available today to uh, gather all that information into a clearinghouse um, after every earthquake. So it's, it's really pretty, pretty neat uh, way to, again, learn um, from earthquakes response. And it's, there's really nothing, I, I can't encourage you more uh, than sometime in your career, if you're doing, uh, you know, continuing to work in the earthquake engineering world that uh, you try and get to an earthquake, uh, post-earthquake uh, response and, and become part of a team that's studying that because it's just an amazing learning experience. Um, so in that regard, uh, there's a, an LFE travel study program that's uh, targeted at young professionals and students to be able to go uh, to earthquake sites around the world. And uh, you can go on the website to learn more about how to uh, access that. So student members, um, a lot of uh, stuff going on. This program uh, is one thing that's uh, a benefit there. Uh, the, the seismic design competition uh, obviously has been changed a little bit this year due to the pandemic. Um, but if you're going to be around, hopefully next year, it'll go back to being a face to face with models to test on small shake tables uh, because it's a great it's a great activity and people really enjoy it. And there's a lot of good great teamwork that, that happens at each of the universities. There's also some student papers and fellowships and things um, to get uh, people to participate in the annual meetings, and uh, and you get free access to the um, the journal, the technical journal of ERI, which is called Earthquake Spectra. So uh, once you graduate, um, you can potentially in graduate school you could become part of the student leadership council, as a mod is. Um, which is an, a great organization that leads the seismic design competition every year and uh, is, is really a, a, a great uh, way to get the student involvement and um, in organization uh, going at, at the various schools. Uh, then there's the Younger Members Committee, which is uh, very active and has a lot of good programs for people as they are transitioning into professional practice or ac ac young academics to, again, uh, build up that network. 
uh, within the organization. There are many of the areas or locations have regional chapters. There's certainly one in, in Southern California um, that is another way to connect with professionals that are interested in earthquake engineering. Um, you can become involved with the seismic design competition, postgraduate internships, and that LFE study trip, as I mentioned. So regional chapters, here are the locations. If you're going to be landing somewhere other than Southern California um, after finishing your academic work, um, these are the places where we've got regional chapters. And again, the ERI tries to encourage membership. Uh, first year is free and reduced rates for the next four years if you're a young member in the organization. And I found that many of many professional um, businesses that are involved with the ERI, like my company, for example, pays for our, all of our, our, our engineers that are members of EERI, pays for the, the registration. So it's not out of pocket. Hopefully, many of the other companies do that as well. So the 2021 uh, virtual annual meeting is coming up here in just a couple of weeks. Um, there's a Meet the Leaders networking event on March 22nd, which I think you can sign up for. Um, I'll be participating in that. And basically, it's a little roundtable discussion that, that um, young members have with uh, some of the leaders and former leaders of the organization and just kind of share information. Um, you can see a virtual reconnaissance um, that's been done during the pandemic we talked about, um, some, some stuff on post-earthquake and the schools initiative and, um, and how you might be able to get published or paper published in Earthquake Spectra. So if you are interested, you can see the uh, website there, go to the, the main website, I'm sure you can find it to uh, join the annual meeting. And I do encourage that if you have some time. Okay, so with that, uh, again, just uh, learn more about the organization at eeri.org. And again, wanna thank the Friedman Family Vis Visiting Professionals Program for making this, uh, this meeting today possible. Okay, so I'm going to let's see. Take that one down. And, oh, oh shoot, the wrong thing. I got to get to the other presentation here. So let's see. Let's see. Sorry about this. So am I, am I still sharing that the screen? Did you see the new presentation? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, so let's dive into the, um, the main uh, topic today, which is seismic design of, oops, so, but, uh, that's not gonna work here. Okay, let's see. Oh. All right, so seismic design of new tall buildings um, and using performance-based uh, engineering. So um, what I'll be talking about today is a series of guidelines that we use for the, for the design and evaluation of, of new tall buildings using performance-based design. And, and you'll, you'll question as to why uh, we actually need guidelines. And um, so let me just make sure I didn't skip something. Um, and so one of the things that has happened on the West Coast a lot uh, in the last 20 years or so is there's been a push toward um, high-rise residential construction. You can see it in downtown LA, San Diego, San Francisco, C Seattle, Bellevue, Washington, et cetera. And um, in, in many of those situations, the, the, the architecture and the planning really wanted to have a core system for the lateral system to allow sort of unobstructed views throughout the, uh, the residences um, out to, you know, when you have a tall building. Um, the, the way the building code was set up in the, um, has, is, or is still set up for a bearing wall system like that, is that there's a height limit of 240 feet. And so um, there's, 
that's that makes it difficult to build. You, you can't build this system um, within the, the confines of the prescriptive building codes that we have. So um, engineers thought about a way to see if there was there was a way they could still demonstrate that their building would perform acceptably and use a system uh, that's not limited or not allowed for that height that was desired. Um, so uh, traditional <coughs> code-based uh, design is, is built on prescriptive rules and linear analysis. And um, that uh, gives us a pretty good handle on, on typical buildings. Um, and we feel like it generally works pretty well for low rise buildings and it's, it's hopefully conservative in most cases, at least what we're doing today is. Um, we don't know how much more capacity they have and, um, and we really don't know at what size earthquake um, the buildings might be vulnerable to severe damage and even collapse, although we don't like to use the, the C word very often when we talk about uh, design and evaluation of, of, of structures for earthquakes. So, um, and our code really doesn't handle that, uh, those questions very well. And uh, really to understand performance, uh, we needed to have uh, more information or more, um, more tools, if you will. And tall buildings are a sort of special class because um, most of what is in the main building code, ESCE 7 uh, design provisions and all the supporting documents really wasn't um, was developed with really tall buildings in mind. And they have some unique uh, characteristics, which you can see here. Their period's obviously very long. Um, they have multi-mode behavior, where, whereas low-rise buildings primarily um, function or respond in the, in the fundamental mode. Um, P delta effects get, get large as you get into tall buildings. Um, obviously, there's a lot of people involved as co potentially compared to smaller buildings. And um, potentially, the impact could be more than just on the individual building if we had, you know, God forbid, a, a, a collapse of one of these buildings in a downtown region. It could impact many other buildings. Um, we've also moved away from just uh, working with linear um, evaluation or design uh, toward uh, dynamic and analysis um, and, and also nonlinear analysis. And we're also going beyond sort of deterministic, which means basically there's a, a bright line. You just, there's a force that's developed and you de design the capacity to that force to a more probabilistic um, evaluation, which recognizes that we don't know what the earthquake um, demands are going to be in the future. Um, so we need to look at it on a probabilistic basis to make sure that we've got enough um, safety factor on our designs. And obviously with uh, you know, more and more computing power over the years, some of the nonlinear procedures that were developed you know, many years ago are now able to be incorporated into, into building practice, whereas they, they weren't just uh, even five or 10 years, or maybe 10 years ago. So, um, you know, it's not really the code writer's fault since really um, uh, code based designs cover 90, I'd say, you know, 95, 90% of the buildings um, pretty well. And uh, it's really when you get very unique designs, complex designs, and certainly tall buildings. And you can see here that um, 14 stories and taller buildings only are about 1% of the building stock that's designed in the United States. So it is a fairly, you know, it's not that um, applicable to, to many of the buildings designed using the building code, but certainly the ones that are, are have a high level of importance. So then, as I mentioned, uh, the, one of the things in ASCE 7 is that there are, I think, 84 different um, systems that are identified that covers reinforced concrete, a structural steel, masonry, wood, and all different kinds of applications, moment frames, brace frames, wall buildings, um, you know, high seismic demand, low seismic demand. So there's a whole, um, you know, a weight or number of things that you can pick, uh, but that doesn't cover everything that engineers and architects can dream up. And you can see a couple of examples here. The, the building on the upper right is a new tower that's been designed in downtown San Francisco. And on the lower right is actually a building under construction in Culver City. 
not too far south of uh, LAX um, that is very close to the Newport Inglewood Fault. And it is, uh, I know a lot about this one, so I'll talk with you about it at the end. But um, so what do we do if we, if we have these different systems or you know, is this really a system at all? Um, and uh, there, is, there is a procedure called FEMA P695. If someone wants to develop a full new system that could someday end up in a building code and cover lots of different applications, uh, there's a procedure to do that, which includes many, many hundreds and thousands of nonlinear response history analyses on different type, uh, different what we call archetype buildings um, to check the performance of those buildings using the rules that are established by the proponent of the new system. But you really can't do that on a one-off building like these two here that I'm showing. So what do we do about that? And we really want to look at what we call capacity-based design. I'll get into that in a minute as well as really thinking about deformation. And if there's one thing to remember from this talk is that when we think about performance-based design and earthquake design in general, um, deformations and displacements are more important in many ways than force um, and the forces that we design for. Uh, because um, what takes a building down is not really overloading it per se for force, but not being able to handle the deformations, right? Of P delta type collapses are really things, kind of things that we're worried about. So what can we do about this? Now, one thing that's good about the building codes is that there is a general statement up in um, section 104 of the International Building Code that says, that allows engineers to kind of step outside the purview of the prescriptive code. And it says that an alternate material design method of construction shall be approved where the building official finds the proposed design is satisfactory and complies with the intent of the provisions and is at least equivalent to that prescribed in the code. Okay, so uh, equivalent performance. So how do we define that, right? And that's where uh, the fund comes in. Um, ASCE 7 has a similar statement uh, to that effect and says that uh, which does open the door for engineers to bring forward um, some designs that stand outside of the prescriptive requirements of the code, such as the, the height limit on these concrete wall buildings. But the problem is, what do you, how do you just establish equivalent performance? And, um, and in some cases, maybe even superior performance. So you need a methodology that's accepted um, by the profession, if you will, and, and will be accepted by the building official that's in charge of you know, um, approving a building permit for the project. We need to understand the seismic hazard um, and be able to evaluate it. Um, we need to be able to model and analyze the structure, uh, not just for linear response, but for nonlinear response and have a way to determine what's acceptable, what's an acceptable deformation or rotation or um, you know, potentially force on some of the members. And so that's where um, these, these guidelines come in. And I've shown four guidelines here. The two that we really focus on uh, today in doing these projects are the two on the right, um, the peer tall buildings initiative guidelines there in the, in the blue color document, and then the Los Angeles Tall Building Structural Design Council document um, are very consistent and similar. Um, and uh, Professor Wallace has worked on the uh, LA Tall Buildings document for many years and is one of the uh, major authors of that. And he also participates on the peer uh, document development. And I was also, um, I'm also one of the people that helped to write the peer building, peer tall buildings guidelines. So, those are the documents we really work with in conjunction with the, the, the rest of the building code to, uh, to determine this about our equivalent of performance. So I mentioned those are the two uh, most widely used guidelines and uh, they do refer to the, the basic standards, both ASCE 7 for new construction and then ASCE 41, which I don't know if many of you have run into that yet in your, in your studies. Uh, but that's what we use for evaluation of existing buildings. And, uh, and it has some performance-based concepts in it that we can use in the guidelines to develop some of those criteria for, for modeling, as well as for acceptance criteria on different uh, elements in, in the structures. 
There's also a really good reference document on mod nonlinear modeling, um, ATC 14. Um, you can Google that and find it. It is now published as a NIST document because NIST was the, um, the sponsor of that, the National Institute of Standards Technology. Um, and that has a really long title and I, I just remember it as ATC 114. Um, one thing to note that this is widely used uh, throughout the West Coast. And uh, I would guess now hundreds of buildings have been um, gone through this process and each, each city handles it a little bit differently as to which document they approve and, 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 and use as the guideline document and how, how the peer, peer reviews are set up. And we'll talk about that uh, as we go forward. So um, performance objectives is a really important part of establishing a, a performance-based design. It's somewhat different than a standard code-based design in that uh, we actually look at the building for two different levels of earthquake. Um, one is the serviceability level, which you can see here has a 43-year mean return period. So this is an earthquake that we would expect most buildings to be subjected to uh, during or hope hopefully every building to be subjected to during its life. Um, and, uh, and then a very rare event, which is the maximum considered earthquake, which is defined in ASCE 7. Um, but the, the design earthquake that we use uh, in the prescriptive code in ASCE 7 is what we call the design basis earthquake, which is generally considered to be about two thirds the size of the MCE event. So that's the kind of the code based design, but the in our performance-based design here, we're really going up to that 2% um, response in a 50 year or maximum considered earthquake. So what kind of risk do we want to uh, accept in these buildings? And this is consistent with ASCE 7. Uh, risk category one and two buildings and most buildings are in risk category two. Risk category one are, are for like agricultural buildings where there's no um, people in the building very often, just store, storage buildings and the like. Maybe some industrial buildings that don't just have equipment, really don't have people in the buildings very often. Risk category two covers everything else except uh, risk category three is generally limited to very large occupancy buildings, like very tall large office buildings that have more than 5,000 occupants as defined by the code, um, or high risk buildings related to uh, chemicals um, and hazardous materials and chemicals. And then risk category four is a special class for buildings that are important to the post earthquake response of a region. So your hospitals, your fire police stations, um, emergency operation centers, those kind of sorts of buildings are in risk category four. And you can see that as we go to a higher risk category, we want to have less and less chance of collapse given a maximum considered earthquake, that, that earthquake that comes around every 2,500 years or so. Um, so that's, that's all worked into the design of these buildings. So I mentioned capacity-based design. Very important concept for performance-based design, and it's being incorporated into our building standards as well. Um, we need to really describe this in our design criteria for the project, so we really understand what the intent of the engineer is. And um, really, the, the concept is that we want to identify where, when the big earthquake hits, where is the inelastic response going to be, and where. Um, are we going to be able to take those large deformation demands and handle those without, you know, collapsing the building? So those have to be identified and properly detailed so they can accommodate those deformations. And then every other element in the building around those uh, deformation controlled elements, if you will, or those yielding elements needs to be des designed to be strong enough to force that inelastic behavior in those members or in those elements. And I've got a little graphic here in a second that I'll, I'll be able to explain that more clearly. Um, it's okay. um, so, so what we do is we classify all the members in the structure as either force control or deformation control. And if you look at the three examples here, we've got a moment frame on the left, a concentric brace frame in the middle and an eccentric, eccentric brace frame on the right. 
The red elements are the deformation controlled elements. So those are the ones when the earthquake hits that we want to um, be taking uh, larger deform large deformations go into the inelastic behavior in inelastic response. And we designed those to be ductile so that they can take that deformation. And then everything else around it, the black members here, the columns in all cases, as well as the braces and the eccentric brace frames are designed as force controlled. So they, they're strong enough to develop yielding in, that, in the link beam uh, here and, uh, or the, uh, the, uh, the columns to be strong enough to form a, a plastic hinge in the beam in a moment frame, for example. And we have three different categories, which we'll talk about in the next, uh, maybe a couple slides. Um, so when we look at these uh, different elements in the, the evaluation now, and I mentioned that the deformations are really the important element to consider. So in our nonlinear evaluations, we don't really do a force check anymore on the deformation controlled elements. But in our nonlinear model, we set limits for the rotations or the strains or our different uh, estimates of the deformation demands on those elements. Um, so then we're tracking those in the evaluation to make sure we don't exceed those limits so that, that we can confirm that we've met the criteria. Um, so sometimes you, you may not meet the criteria and there's some ways to uh, work around that within your model. Um, you can, you can uh, remove that element from the evaluation, if you will, and make sure that the rest of the, of the structure is still working properly and that's an acceptable approach. Or you can consider that uh, analysis unacceptable and in some cases will allow one unacceptable ground motion response. Um, and still allow the building to uh, be considered acceptable overall because we do, uh, because of that uncertainty, um, we require suites of ground motions. And in most cases, um, there are two suites of 11 ground motions for these tall building designs. So 22 different nonlinear response history analysis for different ground motions that are appropriate for the site. So there are three different types of force controlled elements, critical, ordinary, and non-critical. And um, the res if, you, if you sort of exceed that ca force capacity on those elements, um, you can see that you would expect, and the case for the most critical force controlled elements is that we have a higher safety factor, if you will, on those than we do on the non-critical force controlled elements because of the, if something happens to a critical force controlled element, a substantial portion of, of the structure might collapse. So think of columns, et cetera. Um, so I mentioned this before, um, but for acceptance criteria for the MCE for the risk category two buildings, um, maybe the little less important ones, you are allowed to have one of those 11 motions to produce an unacceptable response. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the building will collapse, but it's beyond that the drift limit or deformation limit that we've established as being acceptable. Um, you can, uh, you, it's much harder to get an unacceptable uh, um, response allowed for risk category three building, the very large buildings with the large occupancies, because then you have to have a suite of 20 ground motions and only one can, can fail. And then we don't want any unacceptable response, obviously, on a risk category four, because we need those buildings working, working for us after the earthquake. So there's a whole series of items that we uh, check for unacceptable uh, responses. And you can see here if the model just doesn't converge uh, because potentially it's, it has gotten beyond the ability for the calculations to be performed, that's, that's not a good sign. Um, the valid range of modeling on these deformation control elements I mentioned before, if we get beyond the, the force uh, uh, demand on the force controlled elements. Um, and then uh, that we also have a couple at the bottom, a couple of different overall response checks. And for any individual ground motion, uh, we have a peak uh, dr inner story drift. So that's the, the displacement difference at any time step in any ground motion um, between two stories. So if it's say three inches difference in displacement, over 15 feet height, you take three inches divided by 15 divided by 12, and that's the, 
the, the story drift ratio. And if that's over 0.045, then you've exceeded the limit. Um, another interesting thing about this procedure is that we it's the only place in structural engineering right now that we look at um, residual, what we call residual drift for si in seismic design. That's not covered in any of the prescriptive codes yet. It may be at some point in the future. But the concern there is that <clears throat> after the earthquake, if you can see a residual drift of, of of more than say one and a half percent in your model, um, then and that's like at you know after the, the ground motion has stopped and you stand across the street and you look at a building and it's leaning over, what are you going to do about that building, right? You're probably going to have to evacuate it. So this was a a way to check on uh, the the residual drift that might occur at the end of the ground motion, not just the peak that occurs at any point during the ground motion. So as far as the evaluation procedures, um, we, we're going to have a three-dimensional mathematical model. Um, we're trying to estimate the stiffness, strength, and damping for the different elements in the system, uh, depending on the level of the earthquake and, and really what the test results have been from universities like UCLA and others to, uh, to validate uh, those numbers. Uh, we have to apply viscous damping. If you've taken dynamics yet, you, 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 you know the term viscous damping. Um, in the nonlinear analysis, much of the damping comes from the actual hysteretic behavior of the system, so that inelastic response and the energy dissipation of, the, of those deformation controlled elements. But there is some small damping that's also should be considered that a, a building sort of inherently has in the rest of the structure, whether it's the cladding system or uh, the partitions, other things that when they move can dissipate some energy out of the earthquake. And that's a pretty low number, that 2% number that we typically use, 2 to 3%, is, is much lower than you might use in a, in a standard analysis, which might use 5%. Okay, so modeling nonlinear behavior. Um, so various uh, elements are used or different types of things are used. If you're using a frame system, usually we'll have plastic hinges, if you will. And I showed that in the moment frame slide a few minutes ago. Um, and uh, when we do walls, uh, like in the core wall system here, um, to traditionally the, what we call fiber models are used. So you would use a fiber kind of around the perimeter of that core, and you would track the strains um, throughout the, the, the nonlinear response of the building um, to make sure, again, it's within the limits of that, uh, of that element. Uh, saying we want to have everything in the model that makes a difference to the response, um, including gravity columns, if you will, in some cases. And um, one thing that we found in some of these core wall buildings, and if we look here, this, this one column is fairly close to the core. And in a tall building, when, you, when the building's going to rack over, um, there may be some interaction between that column and this core and, and it's called sort of an outriggering effect. And I'll get into that a little bit later on one of the example buildings. Um, but we, we worry about extra force that could be delivered to that column by the overturning demand in the core when it's clo close to. And, and close to means within about 15 feet or so in most of the, um, the core wall buildings where you've got about an eight inch slab um, that you might uh, get some outriggering effect between the the frame column and the um, and the core wall. So uh, another interesting thing that's covered in the um, in the guideline documents is that what we call the backstay effect. And if if you kind of envision some of these tall condominium towers, if you will, in many of the cities, um, there there's generally going to be either a above grade podium. Uh, maybe with um, you know uh, potentially commercial you know shops or restaurants or things like that, and then often there's below grade parking, right? So what happens is that there's sort of a transition in the lateral system when you hit the podium level and maybe the basement walls, and and so now there's going to be a transfer of force out of the core system to the basement walls and that diaphragm, which is called the here, this main backstay diaphragm, when that transition occurs, say at the top of the basement walls, 
is a very heavily loaded system. It can, and because it's taking out a big chunk of the um, base shear of the building and, and actually could even be larger than the base shear in some cases um, and in the opposite direction to deliver force to the basement shear walls, take it out of the core wall. And uh, so then, and that helps to reduce the overturning demand locally on the core and use the entire system. But one of this is maybe the most important element in the entire building to make sure that we have as a critical force controlled element. And we know that we've got enough strength in that, in that element. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in, the, in the future, in one of the future slides. Uh, we also do some upper and lower bound evaluations of that diaphragm because we know it's probably gonna crack up during an earthquake. And, and change that response of the building. <clears throat> so we, we, we usually look at it in two different ways, sort of at the start of the earthquake, and then a reduced stiffness at the end of the earthquake after there's some damage to that, uh, that backstay diaphragm. <clears throat> some other issues, I mentioned the columns too close to the core already, so I'll move on. Sometimes the architecture needs some irregular openings in a shear wall. Um, as it goes from the core down into the uh, podium and into the basement. This was an example from a project that I reviewed. Um, and uh, so we had a series of openings that would come down. And then it, as we got down, then they, th those openings ended. And then there was a bigger opening um, that was needed for some architectural reasons. And then they wanted to have no openings below it. So what we ended up doing was requiring a strut and tie model and maybe in your advanced concrete class, uh, Professor Wallace might have talked with you about that um, uh, and to try and make sure we understood the load path around those openings and, and to confirm that the design of the shear wall is appropriate. Um, an interface with outriggers, I guess I'll talk with that one about that in one of the future slides since we're kind of moving through the system here. So modeling and analysis, um, again, a really important part of this is, is gathering information from physical tests that are done at university labs and others to get real capacity numbers for our different elements. Um, this is a very important one that came out of a lot of research at UCLA by Professor Wallace on uh, tall slender walls. Uh, you can imagine that in many of those, uh, those high rise buildings, the, the walls are quite tall and slender. Um, so the aspect ratio is, is quite large between the, the length of the wall and the height of the wall. And, um, and he, he's done a number of tests on that to, to, uh, to prove that there are, is some additional strength that can be gained um, for those walls when they are, they are controlled by uh, flexural response uh, above sort of the standard ACI rules for capacity. And so those sorts of things are incorporated into the guidelines to again, do our best estimate on what the real strength of the structural elements in the system are. Okay, so that's a little bit about the guidelines. Then let me talk about the more fun stuff, which is the, um, um, some of the projects that I've reviewed over the years uh, using these guidelines to uh, uh, validate some, some somewhat unique designs. So this is the San Francisco Giants baseball uh, stadium. It was originally called Pac Bell Park. It's now called Oracle Park. Um, and this was an interesting project in that um, if you've ever been there, um, the majority of the structure that you see uh, when you're in your seats um, is, is structural steel. But the primary system is actually a concrete moment frame, which is shown down, down here on the lower right. Um, they felt with a, the a contractor felt that that would be the most um, economical system. Um, and then you can kind of see on the lower left that uh, the, um, there's a lot of uh, structural steel that's, that's out. And that was supposed to evoke what older stadiums uh, looked like when they were built like Fenway Park and, and Yankee, the old Yankee Stadium. So kind of a composite system made for some interesting connections between where the steel changed to reinforced concrete. The other in really interesting thing about this is that the site you can see here is right on San Francisco Bay, um, probably the worst soil one could ever imagine. It's, it is as soft and it's just horrible. <laughs> so um, obviously the entire site has to go down to rock 
And they even had to uh, put what they called rock columns under the field, even though there's no load on it except for the, basically the dirt and, the, and the, the field. But in order so that they wouldn't have settlement over the years, uh, there, are, there are geotechnical engineers um, installed or designed rock, what they call rock columns. So they would dig pits and then fill them with rocks at a, a specific spacing so that the whole site would, would stay level. So just a tremendous amount of work that went into the foundation design and, and the evaluation of that system. Another thing about um, stadia like this is because of their, you know, kind of unique configuration, many times the engineers will break them up into smaller um, chunks, if you will, structurally, so that they're regular uh, and they don't have the kind of curvature here. Um, and I think in this build, this case, this was broken up into the four or, or five, I think five different um, st structures into the one stadium. So there are seismic joints between those that we have to size to make sure we don't have pounding in an earthquake. So the De Young Museum is not a tall building, but certainly a unique one. It's in Golden Gate Park um, near the, the ocean in San Francisco. It's a, obviously a museum. One of the interesting things about museums is that they are generally, the contents are much more valuable than the structure itself. So um, what do you do to try and protect very um, delicate, fragile contents? In most cases, you base isolate the building. And so this was a base isolated uh, museum. You can see, you can kind of get a feel for that here on the lower left, where you can kind of see that the building is propped up a foot or two above the ground. Um, and, uh, and then the other, a couple of other interesting things about this is that this, uh, there was an observation tower, which was a separate structure from the main, um, the main uh, museum was, um, the architect designed it to look like it was twisting and leaning. Um, and uh, the, the, the concrete core is a vertical a vertical core. So the, the lateral system is not leaning or twisting, but the, the, the diaphragms and the mass is. So the engineer record did it, what I thought was a very uh, smart thing to do is they actually put vertical post tensioning in the walls to clamp the building down and together. Otherwise in an earthquake, if you imagine that the the, the, the center of mass is changing over the height of the building. If there was an earthquake, it would tend to sort of rock toward that, the, you know, the, the way it's leaning. And this post-tensioning would resist that from happening. Another thing that you can see in the upper right is these major um, openings in the diaphragm where the architect wanted to bring natural light into the museum spaces. And uh, that created some really interesting challenges for the engineer to uh, deal with the seismic demands and be able to transfer all the forces around and get them, get them to the resisting elements and then down to the base isolation system. So LA Live is downtown LA, uh, right immediately adjacent to the Staples Center. It's a 54-ish story building, yep, um, which is the tallest, what we call steel plate shear wall building in the world. It's, uh, it's actually not one of the concrete cores but instead uses steel plates to um, replace the concrete shear walls around the elevator um, and stair shafts of the building. Um, interesting in that um, it's, it has an L shape to it. You can kind of see that on the lower right where you can see the face of the tall 54 story tower and then the, the, the breadth of the, the 27 story hotel. Um, and, and so it's an L shape for 27 stories and then it's just a single tower for the, for the second 27 stories. And that creates some interesting torsion in the building and some, some diaphragm transfers. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then the podium, I will talk about later, uh, that transfer diaphragm we talked about um, a little bit, a bit ago. Uh, this one had maybe the most challenging one I'd ever seen and I'll, I'll demonstrate that to you in a couple slides. So here's the, the issue with the L shape um, for the lower part of the building and then the, just a single tower. So once we hit the roof of the hotel, um, there's, a, there's a, a, a wall out here at the, at the far end of the, or the, the tail, if you will, of the, uh, the other wing. And so some of the load is gonna be delivered out of the, the tower walls 
over to this wing uh, wall over here. So this roof becomes another one of those transfer diaphragms. And the, en the engineer needed to recognize that it wasn't a standard design and it ended up being much more heavily reinforced in order to make that transfer work and not get uh, a lot of damage in that location. I'll talk about the transfer diaphragm at the base um, in a couple more slides. So uh, Wilshire Grant's another one downtown LA. It's the tallest building west of Chicago, 72 stories. Uh, very interesting design, it, very narrow in the short direction. And so they used uh, these outrigger systems, which uh, um, again, the idea there is to increase the stance of the building. I don't think we have another. Oh yeah, look out. I'll catch up with that in a second. Um, so there's, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, they also use what we call belt trusses to um, spread the load around the perimeter of the building and, and equalize the force in the columns that carries the load down to the foundations and the foundation design. There was also some interesting uh, work um, in field welding that hasn't been done before ever uh, with uh, submerged arc welding in the field to, to connect some very large plates together to speed up construction. And then this, this building has, still has the record for the largest single pour of concrete at 22,000 yards of concrete. So that's about two, over 2,000 trucks of concrete that was poured um, into a 21 foot thick mat over about a 12 hour period one Saturday morning. So outriggers, talk about that a little bit now. Um, oops, I'm, shoot, I'm already going over time, right? <laughs> Darn it. Um, I'm gonna go fast then. Um, so outriggers, the idea here is to, when you have a very tall and narrow system like um, this um, building in the transverse direction to spread out the resistance uh, for the overturning in the system, you, you push out and you grab, intentionally grab the perimeter columns. Um, I mentioned that before, it sometimes is unintentional. In this case, it was very intentional at three different levels. Um, and we also put an element here called a buckling restraint brace that's a, a can con control the force that gets delivered to those outrigger columns because we don't want to get those overloaded. And that was a, a, a primary factor in, re in reducing the, um, the period of the building to a manageable level. 181 Fremont is in San Francisco. It's an all steel tower, very narrow, uh, to, very, uh, very small footprint. Um, so it incorporated, which you can see on the, the here in this graphic, um, non-linear or uh, multi, or we, they call them mega braces that go on the order of 18 stories between uh, connected connections to the corners of the building. And so that created some interesting challenges for the design. Um, they, they also needed to add some viscous dampers uh, to the building to control uh, wind uh, de deformation. And so that uh, the people that lived in the condominiums up at the top of the building didn't get seasick when there was um, large, uh, large wind storms. We also had some uh, details there for uplifting the corner columns to, again, reduce the demand on the, um, on the foundations and to basically control the, the overall demand in the building. Oceanwide Plaza is downtown LA, also three towers. You can see here in the upper right on a single podium. Um, so that created a, a challenge. This, this became a, a risk category three building because of the occupancy of those three towers and the podium. Um, and uh, the other cores in these two towers were offset from the, from the center of the building to the edge of the building on the far side of the, this, this picture here. Uh, which created some torsion in the system that had to be worked out. Um, Matt foundation, basement walls, and I'll talk about the podium here in a second. So here's some of this podium issue. This is the, the um, ocean-wide building here in the center. You can see the offset cores for the two smaller towers here, the, the two main cores for the taller tower, and then the main podium. So this evaluation of this, this podium level with all those forces coming from the shear walls became quite complicated and uh, created a lot of uh, different um, uh, ramifications for the design. Uh, this sketch here in the upper right was, um, I mentioned on the LA Live project, um, where 
Unfortunately, the, the two main cores uh, or shear wall cores came down to <clears throat> the podium and the architect, <clears throat> excuse me, had designed an opening for escalators to get from the podium down into the, into the um, parking garage right where the force wanted to transfer out of the core walls to be delivered over to the basement walls. And we couldn't get the architect to move or the, the engineer record couldn't. We, we certainly pushed the engineer record to ask if they could just move that elevator um, uh, opening over a few feet, then we could have a nice, what we call a collector or drag element to deliver the force into the podium diaphragm to get it over, then over to the basement walls. Instead, they couldn't do that, so they had to push the load all over to this small area to the left of the core, and then with strut and tie models, carry the load around the core, and then back to deliver collectors on either side of the wall. So not a very efficient or elegant structural design, um, but it was sort of a brute force approach to that. So I mentioned risk categories before, I won't spend much time on this, but all three of the towers were risk category two because by themselves they're fairly small, but once they hit the podium, the entire structure became risk category three. And there's some guidance now in the tall building guidelines about projects like these, which are pretty unusual. Rainier Square is in uh, Seattle, downtown Seattle. This is a, a pretty famous building now. It's the second tallest building in Seattle. Um, it's the first use of a, a new system called a composite sandwich wall, and the American Institute of Steel Construction now calls it Speed Core. Um, it's a, the idea is to use two steel plates with tie rods between the steel plates, and then fill those with concrete, in um, and and replace the reinforcing steel in the core in the shear walls in the core. So it's a composite wall between the steel plates and the uh, and the reinforced concrete core. Um, it also has outriggers, etc. So uh, this is a very interesting design to review as well. Oceanwide Center, I showed a picture of that in San Francisco. Um, a couple of towers, one um, concrete core, uh, condominium tower, and a new office building. Similar to 181 Fremont has these sort of mega braces, about eight stories tall in this case with a faceted exterior on the front uh, for the architectural design. This is a, a buckling strain brace frame uh, building system and uh, has some, some other types of systems on the back which are away from the, for, the storefront. And then last but not least I mentioned is the wrapper tower. Um, and if you Google those uh, that with the, with the parentheses and a capital W, you can get you can see pictures of this under construction now. Again, it's about one and a half miles from the Newport Inglewood Fault. These are two foot by one foot built up box shapes that wrap the perimeter of the building. There are no columns in this building. All the gravity forces get transferred out to the, the bands, if you will, uh, with connections through the, 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 the perimeter system. Um, in the back of the building, which you really can't see here, uh, there is a core of uh, steel plate shear walls. And because this building is so unique and close to this, the, the faults, um, the peer review panel basically worked out with the engineer record that this had to be a base isolated building because we weren't gonna be able to develop the knowledge of this building enough to believe that we could, we could have uh, ductility in these members of this system. So, uh, we went into a, a very different type of analysis and evaluation uh, or as a result using the base isolation. And then essentially the entire structure about, above the isolators is a force controlled element um, that uh, that's, is you know, limited by the base isolation system. Okay, so summary, and sorry I ran over. Um, lots of uh, interesting challenges on these signature projects. The, the performance-based guidelines gave us the ability to do this. Takes a lot of work between the engineer record and the peer review panel, which is required on all of these projects. Um, some updates have been done to the, the documents based on the results of some of some of the earlier projects that were designed using them and uh, continuing to push the envelope and in innovation in, in structural design. So with that, I think I will go into questions and discussion and maybe um, stop sharing here. I'm going to go back and see everybody's face and I can see what kind of questions might have come up. So 
sorry for going over a little there, but um, okay. So let's see. Are there... Thanks, Jim. It was a uh, an interesting and informative lectures. I think. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much. Right. Yeah. I, I knew I was going to have to sprint through. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let's see. I guess we'll. Uh, Peter Lee, do you have a question? Um, no, but I can think of one. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's it. Raise, raise your hand. So I thought. Hi, Jim. Uh, I have Bye. a question. Or are sure. you able to agree? Oh, yeah. Uh, thanks for the presentation. That was really uh, interesting. Um, and so my question is for all the projects that you went over and that you've done for peer review, uh, there must have been clearly a lot of lessons learned. And I know that Degenko does a lot of retrofits and working with existing. And so I'm wondering, has there been anything significant from, from what you can remember that you learned from a peer review project that you've been able to implement in a, a retrofit project? That's a good, good question. Um, so a lot of the retrofits that uh, we do will use similar concepts, right? The capacity-based approach, the um, so a lot of the modeling techniques are similar when we're looking at some of the nonlinear analysis there. And uh, so, yeah, there are some definitely some lessons. Um, I think that one of the things that this idea of the transfer diaphragm, which has become so important for us in these tall buildings, um, I don't think people, engineers back in the 70s and 80s really were thinking about that nearly as much. Things that we would see today that might need a 12 or 14 inch diaphragm um, slab may only have six or eight inches at the ground floor in some of these older buildings. So we, we really have to be careful about how to model those in the existing buildings. So that's one, one area that I think, uh, and, and also some of the techniques for um, the different ways to do the retrofits can, can be helped by some of the new design in the, in the peer reviews that we've done. A good question. Thanks. Anyone else? Hi. Uh, thank you. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, right. I have a question. Okay. And um, for most of your project, I can see you mentioned the composite columns, composite systems, and I'm a bit confused about uh, what the composite refer to. So is it about the composite, uh, composite materials or just the composite to different systems? Oh, okay, good question. So generally, it, uh, composites are composite elements. So uh, reinforced concrete and structural steel working together is, as a shear wall or as a column or something like that. So um, they're, they're, it, in many cases, you can take advantage of where concrete is great, which is in compression, right? But um, steel might be better than concrete. Obviously, reinforced concrete is why you put rebar in it. Um, but uh, so steel can take the compression or the tension, concrete can take the compression and you can get a more efficient system that way. So it's really about the materials rather than mixing systems. Okay, got it. I see. Other questions? Um, hi, hi, I sorry, let me just, I don't have a question, you can go next, but um, I just wanted to mention, uh, because you brought up the ERI annual meeting that's coming up at the beginning of your presentation. Yep. Uh, so our student chapter of ERI is offering uh, subsidies to students interested in attending. So I'm just gonna put an interest form in the chat. And if anyone here is interested in attending the meeting at a reduced price, you can fill out the interest form and we'll get back to you about the details. Great, thanks Hunter. Yeah, that's, uh... That's great. It's, I do, it's usually student rates are very low anyway. And if, if you guys can support them even more, that's great. But I think you'll find it pretty interesting, even though it'd be a lot better and more interesting if everybody could be there together. But, uh, um, but I'm, I'm, I know that there's a lot of great sessions and, and great. And a lot of the sessions at ERI are, are, as I said, more like cross-disciplinary. So there'll be a panel discussion where there might be a structural engineer, a geotechnical engineer,
an urban planner and a building official or something like that talking about a topic where you can get a real good idea of all the different issues or perspectives that, that go into some of the decisions about a seismic design or something like that. Other questions? Yeah, um, I wanted to ask about, so in a peer review, there's, I think, ways that you can make the uh, process efficient for the evaluation and there's the elements of a strong communication. And so I was wondering if you could speak upon uh, what are those elements and what makes- Sure, yeah. sure, yeah. No, it's, it's really critical actually. Um, the, the most important thing in those projects is really what we call the basis of design document, because remember, um, they're not using the standard code procedures, right? Or they're using some of it, but not all of it, but, or they're doing some things that are outside of it. So the very first step in all of these reviews is to, to work with the engineer of record on establishing the basis of design. And this is this becomes the building code for the project, right? And, and basically they say, I'm going to evaluate this element this way, and I'm going to model it this way, and this is the acceptance criteria, and this is the damping I'm going to use. And so every, every decision point that they're going to use in their design has to be documented and logged into this basis of design document. And, and that gets approved by the peer review panel and the city before the engineer really goes very far with their design, right? Because we don't want them to have to design it twice, right? They, they design it and they come back to us. And then we disagreed with something that they, the you know, way they approach something and you get into a fight and then it's, it's not pretty. Um, so the best thing is at the start really to work that a lot, as many of those issues as you can out. And then be, recognize that once in a while, you won't, you won't be able to um, identify every major issue that's going to come up on a project at, before you even start. So when something does come up, basically what we'll do then, you know, is, is say, well, gee, we weren't thinking about it this way, or we, we didn't really bring this up, but we think it's important to, to document. So then could you please add it to the basis of design so that the final document covers the whole design process? So that's a great tool for us to really um, have a good communication path. The other thing that is done generally is a what's called a, a, log, a comment log. And so traditionally, it's a pretty simple tool. It's just a, like a, a you know Excel spreadsheet, which has some pages. There might be a, a page for structural issues, a page for geotech issues, a page for ground motion issues, and then a, a, you know other, other issues. And, and then a kind of a, a, a way to track comments. So if we make a comment that asks a question of the engineer record, about you know, this response or how are you doing this, then they have to respond. And then we either say, yes, we agree or no, you know, document this. And so there's a little back and forth. And then we track those until we everything but con considers them resolved. And that's how we kind of know that we're done at the end is that all the comments have been resolved um, through that process. So those, those are the two primary communication tools. And the other thing is being I mean, we have multiple meetings and obviously they're all Zoom meetings now or, or um, the like, but, um, but oftentimes when there's a major submittal, um, we will, the review team will look over, look it over for a week or so. And then the, the engineer record will get on and we'll talk about the kind of the major topics that are in that submittal to help us you know, kind of know what's in the engineer's mind as they as they were putting that together and what we should be looking for and where and, so, and that kind of thing. So it's it's almost like you're trying to be a team with the, the engineer record as the peer review team. Thank you. Sure. Okay, any other questions? Could you comment on what either your favorite project has been or maybe the most grueling one that just wouldn't work out very easily throughout the process? Uh, well, <laughs> as far as, well, um, uh, it's hard to talk. The favorite, the favorite project that I've reviewed, 
Um, no. I mean, I have favorite ones that I've designed myself, but that, that's easier to say. But um, maybe the favorite one I reviewed might have been, might have been, well, I'm partial to the Giants baseball stadium because I grew up a few miles from the old stadium and I'm a big Giants fan. So I, it was kind of fun to be involved with the new stadium. That, that was kind of fun from a personal perspective. Um, I, I, the 181 Fremont project, which is the one that had those mega braces, that was a very fun one for me because it had so many different um, aspects to it. So many, there was half a dozen things that probably have never been done before on that project. So that, that was pretty fun to work through. Um, the most challenging one, that wrapper tower was very challenging. And uh, the, I've got one I'm working on right now up in Seattle where the engineer, it's a very, very small footprint um, condo tower. So the, there's only a few apartments around the perimeter and um, they, it's such a small footprint that they can't really, and it's very tall, it's like 600 feet tall. It's like 50 something stories, nine stories. So it's like 660 feet tall. Um, so they can't really use an outrigger system like I'd said you know, before and so the, and this 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 pen is probably too uh, um, too thick, if you will. But the 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 aspect ratio of the lateral system is like a pencil, um, and and that's created a very long period, much longer than anyone that we've we've dealt with before. And so we've been pushing the engineer pretty hard on being able to validate that this system isn't sort of out of bounds of the well, our, our ground motions, we don't have a good feel for really, really long periods about what the, what the characteristics of the motions are. And so there's a lot of uncertainty out there. Um, it has some, uh, some really significant demands on the foundations because the outrigger tends to spread the demand to the foundations out more. So now it's much more concentrated under the core. And so that's a challenge. Um, the walls in that most of the time in these core wall buildings, we see walls between 24 to 36 inches on the, on the tallest uh, thick walls, which are huge, obviously, right? This, this one has some 54 inch thick walls. <laughs> and so that's, that I haven't seen before either. Um, so we've been uh, working, Professor Jack Mealy is from Berkeley is one of the peer reviewers with us on that. And he's been asking a lot of interesting questions about um, how they're detailing things, and do they really understand the load transfers and things like that? And the at that you know at those transfer levels where I was talking, where the, the core comes down and hits the transfer level, there's one location where the collector steel that they need to deliver the load out into the diaphragm to move over to the shear walls it needs 209 number 11 bars, and so it. And it's this, it, we're still trying to figure out how in the world they're gonna detail that and get that to, to work. But I think that transfer diaphragm is like 30 inches thick. And so it's sort of pushing the bounds, <laughs> if you will, on, uh, on what's typically done or typically been done. So uh, I think we have over 300 comments on that one already. Um, so it's, uh, it's, a little, it's been challenging. We're getting, we're getting there though. <laughs> It's, we've been working on it for over two years with them, but uh, getting close to the end. Okay, other questions? Um, I just wanted to ask one last question. Sure. Um, how's life been different after being elected to the National Academy of Engineering? Congrats regarding that. Uh, well, um, yeah, it's well, it's it was strange feeling. I'll tell you that. Um, to it's a it's a big shock. It's it's sort of a you know all of a sudden they just send you an email saying you've been elected, and it's like I didn't even know I was being considered. Um, so that and then the first couple of weeks, I probably got three or four hundred emails about it, and then and then like my LinkedIn, there it was announced on LinkedIn and. There were 400 comments on LinkedIn and stuff like that. So, you know, you kind of get inundated with that. Um, other than that, it doesn't change it much, to tell you the truth. 
Um, but uh, it's it. The one thing for me was I thought back about all the things that happened in my career, right? From the time I was at Berkeley and, you know, I was very lucky. I, I, uh, I did some research in my master's program with a professor named Igor Popov, who was a kind of a, a giant in, in structural steel. And, uh, and I was able to sneak in and, and do some research with him uh, on a project that he had six PhDs and I was the only master's student. He had six PhDs working on this system, eccentric brace frames, and he let me in to do some more tests for, and so I, you know, I was able to do that. And then, and then he, uh, he was a great supporter for me for the rest of my career or, or as when he was alive. Um, and then, you know, a few years later, the Northridge earthquake hit and damaged steel buildings. And uh, Professor Popoff and another professor at Berkeley, Professor Mayen, um, and some others put together a proposal to FEMA to study the damage from the earthquake. And they asked me to be one of the leaders of that program and, and kind of or oversee all the research that was done for six years. And my company said I could do that, you know, and, and it was sort of a half-time project or half-time work for me for six years. And then, you know, and so that was, I mean, the timing, if it, if it happened five years earlier, they wouldn't have asked me because I wouldn't have had enough experience. And if it was 10 years later, I probably said I couldn't, I was too busy with other things. I couldn't handle it. So the timing of that. And then that caused a real change in how AISC and the steel industry was going to have their seismic provisions. And Professor Popoff was the chair of that committee um, in 1995, and uh, he was the, he had been the only chair of that committee. And at the time, he was 85 years old, and he's still the chair of this committee. And he he realized that they, there was going to be so many changes coming forward that it would probably be better for someone younger to be running that or being the chair. So the AISC said, well, sure, that makes sense. Who should be the chair? And, and he said, me. And I wasn't even on the committee yet. And he said, he thought I would be the best person to chair it. So, you know, so all those things have to, kind of, a lot of dominoes, right? That have to be in place for something like this to happen. And, and having a great co a company that really supported everything from, and for me throughout my career and in my, my network, right? Of people from Berkeley and, other engineers and things. It's 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 humbling to think about that when something like this happens. So thanks for the question. Okay, other questions. I just wanted to comment that that's just an incredible story about uh, mentorship and adding value yeah. and collaboration. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. You know, one thing about our profession, I think it's it's very unique in that regard. Um, it's a very supportive collegial collaborative environment. Um, I have friends that, yeah, um, in my neighborhood here, there are professionals, they're, you know, attorneys or accountants or, you know, other kinds of finance people and stuff like that. And, and when I'm, I tell them I'm going to a conference and, you know, and giving a presentation and, and they're like, they're like, wait, you, wait a minute, you guys go and tell each other what you do. And, you know, like the, 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 the highest state of the art stuff. And I said, of course we do. <laughs> and they think we're crazy, right? Why would you ever, why would you ever share that? You, know, you want to keep that. They say, well, you don't understand, you know, we're civil engineers. We're, public safety is more important than our own built, our own, you know, companies. So, so that part I think is, is a really neat part of who we are as engineers. And that, that kind of environment is what you, what you, you, you uh, notice there. So, yeah. It really is different. Okay. Other questions or comments? Hey, Jim, it's Henry. Hey, Henry, how are you? Good, good. I enjoyed your talk. I'm, I'm kind of cycling in and out of, um, I have office hours, so I'm kind of cycling okay. back and forth here. But I was interested to hear, um, in terms of tall buildings in general and, and the various TDI related mm -hmm. documents, has the 
has this situation with the Millennium Tower sort of informed like future directions of the doc the document or things that you plan to study? Sure. Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. So I, maybe I'll do a little quick thing on Millennium Tower. Um, so if you don't, if you're not too aware of it, there's a, a tower in San Francisco, um, basically about a block from that 181 Fremont project that I mentioned. And it, um, it was actually designed just prior to the start of the um, performance-based age, if you will. So it technically was not a peer-reviewed performance-based design project. Um, it, uh, after being, well, while it was being constructed, it, it began to sink and, and settle. And by the time they finished, they topped out the building. And at the time, it was the second tallest building in San Francisco. It's been passed by a few now, but um, and not just because it's sank. But um, it uh, it has sunk about 18 inches, and the design would called for it to sink about three to four inches. And by the time they finished building it, it had already sunk 10 inches. And so since it's been built, it's sunk another eight inches. And it's also tilted a little bit uh, because some of the soil is a little stiffer than the others and things like that. And um, so part of the problem was that originally the building was designed as an all steel constructed building. And the general contractor on the project um, is very, is well known as being a, uh, like the best concrete construction contractor in the Bay Area. And they, they went to the owner and told them that if they went to a concrete core wall system, they could potentially save X million dollars, a few million dollars uh, in construction. And so they went to the, the geotechnical engineer because the the foundations had already been approved and because they're, again, downtown San Francisco, the soil's not very good. So they had piles in the design, the deep foundation piles. And those piles were designed to go and stop in a layer of sand that's about 100 feet below um, the foundation. But below that layer, that sand layer, there's another 100 feet of what they call Old Bay clay or Old Bay mud that goes down to the rock foundation down about 200 feet down. And um, the, the, new, the new design with the concrete was about 30% heavier than the original design that, that they had done on the piles. So apparently, and I don't know all the details because this was a, you know, all kinds of lawsuits flying around after this happened. Um, apparently the, the geotechnical engineer re-looked at their calculations and, and determined that the, the design they had would be adequate. And so they went ahead and obviously it wasn't adequate. And, uh, and so, and the, and the settlement happened. Um, it's now, it's, been resolved as far as the legal parts, and it's they're they're doing some additional uh, foundation work around the perimeter of the building to tie into the existing system to uh, to basically stop it from going much further, and to try and get rid of some of the tilt. They're pushing harder on on one side than the other, <laughs> so it's it's kind of an interesting uh, um, balancing act. But uh, the one thing that did change in San Francisco, it, and it hasn't, this hasn't changed in the other cities, but in San Francisco now, um, it's required to not only have a ground motion evaluation and peer reviewer, but also a foundation peer reviewer um, for these deep, these deep systems. Now, in many ways, it's not really that needed because uh, frankly, before the building was even occupied, pretty much all the engineers, geotechnical and structural doing any of these big projects knew what was going on. And no other building piles, uh, every other building that's been designed since then, all their piles go all the way to the rock down 200 feet. They're not, they're not trying to 
mess around with the old bay clay anymore and, and think that it's not gonna it's not gonna compress. So um, but but that's that's one thing that did change is that there's some additional requirements for review now for the foundations that weren't required prior to millennium. Okay, thanks. Sure. Oh, and one thing, if you don't know, um, those of you that don't know, uh, Professor Burton was uh, a proud uh, Egan Kolb engineer for a number of years. Um, he was an intern with us, and then he went to Stanford for grad school, his master's, and then came back and worked with us for six years, I think, Henry, and then uh, went back and got his PhD at Stanford, and then now, obviously, at UCLA. Uh, we're, we're, we're proud of Henry, and, and, and really, uh, he's just doing great work. Okay, other questions or comments? Okay. I guess everybody's tired. <laughs> I think we, we were scheduled to go to 1.30, right? So we pretty much hit it. <laughs> All right, well, if there's okay. no else i don't see anything in the chat um thank you for the time and the questions they were great appreciate it and i uh, hope this was somewhat uh of interest and in, and in, uh, you learned a few things here and um remember deformations uh, remember force controlled versus deformation controlled elements and capacity design and uh, you'll do a good job on your uh on your seismic designs and and, and always detail for ductility <laughs> all right thanks again Appreciate Thank it. you, Jim. So Thank you.